Yesterday, when I took you for a spin in my library, I uh, pulled out this book, The Man Who Called Himself Poe, by Sam Moskowitz, and I was unable to find the piece in it which I think was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier. So I'm going to return to that today. This is a really tough case to prove. Um, I have only one precursor work that I'm absolutely certain or that I can pretty much prove was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier. The rest of them, I think, were written afterwards. And, you know, I'm... I'm pretty certain they're written by Matthew, but it's very tough to prove in short notice. So, um, nonetheless, I'm going to proceed because I think it's important. This story is called The Atlantis. It's signed Peter Prospero, LLD, M-A-P-S. I don't think that uh, actually that was the original pseudonym. This comes from the American Museum of Science, Literature, and the Arts, published in Baltimore in the issues of September 1838 to June 1839, inclusive, it says. Um, the full title of the piece is The Atlantis, A Southern World or a Wonderful Continent, discovered in the Great Southern Ocean and supposed to be the Atlantis of Plato or the Terra Australis Incognita of Dr. Swift, during a voyage conducted by Alonzo Pinzon, commander of the American metal ship Astria. Uh, and then he goes on and describes it. He believes that that was written by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, I do not. I think that it was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier, possibly several years earlier. And um, I didn't write down the name of the earlier incarnation of this publication, but the history is that it was being published, as I recall, in Pennsylvania. And then uh, this fellow bought it and moved it to Baltimore. Now, when you buy a newspaper and move it to another city, what are you actually doing? I mean, it's kind of strange. What are you moving? You're moving the name, but the name is changing. So what's the difference between starting a newspaper in Baltimore and buying a newspaper in Pennsylvania and moving it to Baltimore? The only difference is you have to have something physical, I would assume, like the printing press, you know, uh, the equipment, and the subscribers, possibly, the contributors, I meant, and the subscribers, maybe, and possibly some of the works that had been submitted to that journal, which had not yet been published. That would be the main reason to buy a newspaper if you're not going to retain the name. I was just logically kind of thinking through this. So I believe that this had been submitted as a rather large manuscript by Matthew to the previous incarnation many years earlier, like 1831 or two or something, however long, because I believe it goes back quite a while. I should have done my homework. I don't have that in front of me. Um, and that they had it on file and that they bought the files. This fellow bought the files. So uh, what they did, I think, was to southernize it, which means that they uh, took out the anti-slavery references and made them either neutral or pro-slavery, and that they set the uh, protagonist in the South and made him uh, a uh, resident of North Carolina, you know, and, and he attended a college in North Carolina instead of somewhere in New England. However, they left in the people that he admired, in particular, Benjamin Franklin. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, Matthew Franklin Whittier very much admired his namesake, Benjamin Franklin. There's a uh, very nice biography that he, a biographical sketch he wrote of Franklin for the News and Courier in uh, Amesbury, Massachusetts in 1837 or early 1838, right before he launched his own newspaper. But uh, he, it's a nice little biography. I think there's another one that he wrote elsewhere, which is a little tougher to prove. And he signed Franklin for uh, Franklin or F for quite a few things that he uh, published over the course, course of his life. Franklin, Franklin Jr., Franklin in all caps. He used different variations of it. So the first character that uh, is met by the protagonist is Benjamin Franklin. I think what this is, is Matthew showing off the education that Abby had given him over a period of several years. 
and uh, it really reads like somebody who's showing off their education, if you ask me. It's, it's, it's young. This is young Matthew who's quite proud of what he's achieved because he was a farm boy, you know, and, and Abby has really given him a full uh, liberal education. <clears throat> but uh, let's see. This thing, I, I won't read the part where he goes on his expedition, but he comes off as an educated man. And then he arrives in this city, which is basically heaven, but it's a physical heaven. And here he's meeting with Dr. Franklin. So I'm going to read just a little bit of that. Then we'll go into what I believe are Matthew's other works that bear on this. Chapter 4, my meeting with Dr. Franklin and the proceedings of the Philosophical Society. After taking supper, I retired to my room to obtain repose. And although from the agitation of my spirits and extreme excitement of mind, I found some difficulty in composing myself to rest, yet at length I found in that temporary suspension of thought which takes place in sleep, the relief and refreshment which my exhausted nature required. Remember, Matthew had insomnia, and he did put a lot of himself into these pieces. Upon waking in the morning and being summoned to breakfast, it is impossible to describe my sensations when I discovered seated at the table by my side the old and valued friend of my father, Dr. Franklin, upon whose knees I had been oftentimes dang dandled in early life, in whose society I had been intimate, and for whose character I had always under entertained unbounded veneration and sincere attachment. This is symbolic. It means that he's been named after Franklin and he has grown up with Franklin's uh, influence and in writings. He soon recognized me, and after the warmest salutations, we entered into an interesting conversation, and he promised to introduce me to the acquaintance of the most celebrated men with whom the city of Saturnia, which is the name of the city they, they're in, abounds. Here, said he, are assembled the great and good of all ages and nations. They unite the labors of their, of their genius in the structure of science and the perfection of literature and the arts. And it goes on like that. So, uh, I mean, again, it's kind of a kind of a show-off piece. I've got the whole thing from one source or another digitally, but uh, he only goes into the first four chapters in this book. I'm not able to find an original copy of the publication that it originally appeared in, the Museum of Science, Literature, and the Arts. Now we're going to go to my one piece of pretty strong evidence here. This is the constellation, the New York constellation. And there's a series by Peter Pendergrass in this. There's the four show up in the March 19, April 2nd, April 23rd, and May 21st, 1831 edition. That's my notes. I don't know why I'm showing you that. Here is the constellation, the one that I have a physical copy of, which is the April 2nd, 1831 edition. It's not necessarily the best one from the writing standpoint, but it's the one I have a physical copy of. It appears on the, I took out my marker, three, fourth, page, which can maybe get up to the camera there, for those of you that want to um, stop these things and look at the still image. Peter Pendergrass is a variation on the pseudonym that Matthew used to use, a great many of these PP pseudonyms. He would use the initials PP, but he would also make up these names like Peter Pendergrass or uh, Peter Pumple. It goes on and on. I can't remember all of them because, again, I get deer in the headlights when I get in front of a camera. My memory goes. But uh, there's, I haven't counted them all, but maybe 10, 8, 10 of these things that he created. That's why I believe that Phineas Pica in the New England magazine which the editor, Joseph T. Buckingham, claimed for his son Edwin, was actually written by Matthew because it's one in a long series of PP signatures, all of it based on his childhood nickname, Peter Pumpkin.
I'm going to read a little bit of this. What it is, is uh, this fellow has gone to the moon in a, in a steam rocket ship. This is 1831. This is before Edgar Allan Poe write, wrote about going to the moon. But this is social satire. It's tongue in cheek. I would say it's heavily influenced by Gulliver's Travels, if you ask me. It's kind of a modern technological version of 1831 of Gulliver's Travels. So this fellow goes to the moon. He meets the man in the moon. He talks about all of their social institutions. And as I said, it's an opportunity for social satire. But I'll uh, read a little bit down here. This is Celestial Correspondence, Letter 2, Fum Fum, The Moon, Second Glimdung, H-A-H-L-5001, The Year. Um, he talks about a woman who was there who had died of a sonnet. She submitted a sonnet to the newspaper, and I guess they hadn't printed it, and she died. And here in the moon, everybody appreciates it. And he gives the poem. This is all typical Matthew. But then I'm going to go down a little bit. The violence of parties here is very great. The principal factions at present are the Steptodians and the Stephelians. Heel, H-E-E-L. They take their names respectively from their different modes of walking. The Steptodians first touch their toes to the ground and contend this is the only proper mode of walking. While on the other hand, the Stephelians bring down their heels first and as strenuously contend that this is the only proper mode. These factions include both sexes and their differences are carried to such a height as nearly to preclude all neighborly intercourse. The ladies never visit one another and those of each party would sooner burst than speak to one of the opposite faction. The parents enjoin it upon their sons and daughters respectively to turn their backs upon the sons and daughters of their opponents. It is not, however, so easy in all cases to restrain the younger branches within the bounds of party, and, like Romeo and Juliet, they sometimes consult their own wishes instead of those of the old people, in which case, being disowned, by both the great factions, they naturally form a third party, which, in derision, is denominated the Quiltonians, <laughs> and is held in no respect by either of the other parties. And then it goes on like that. So Matthew was in that situation, you know, he was Quaker, Abby was Catholic, and their parents didn't approve and uh, they found their way around it. So that also is autobiographical. This is somewhat more tongue-in-cheek than the, the uh, piece that is thought to have been written by Poe, but not too much. It's basically along the same lines. It's science fiction with uh, kind of social commentary, you know, and there's kind of famous people involved you know, that he's meeting, and it's pretty similar. So Matthew would do that. He, he'd write something, and then he'd perfect it later on with another version. So, again, I think that he definitely wrote this uh, Peter Pendergrass piece. I think he wrote the other one, submitted it, and it was never published because it was kind of long, and they didn't want to uh, publish something that way. Now, there's other pieces that Matthew wrote. There's one more here that's science fiction. It's kind of philosophical science fiction fantasy. And this goes back to 1832 in the New England Magazine, which I recently talked about, published by Joseph T. Buckingham and his son Edwin. It's the same editor that used to publish the New England Galaxy in Boston, which Matthew first started publishing in as a boy of 12 in 1825. So he goes back a long ways with this editor this one I don't have a physical copy of, uh, it's, but it's signed with his asterisk. It's one of the very first that he ever used that asterisk signature for, the star. He was using, as of December 1832, he was using it, I believe, to sign book reviews in The Essayist, which I also showed you yesterday. So uh, I printed it out because I don't have a physical copy, but I do have one that I can put on the screen from the Hathi Trust. You can find this in the Hathi Trust if you're 
connected with an academic institution, you can download the whole book. Otherwise, you have to do what I did and download individual pages. So I printed it out, but my printer was dying. You know, it prints the last page first. And when it got to the first page, the ink was almost out. <laughs> so if I stumble on this one, I have an excuse. But I want to read a couple paragraphs and then get into this. This is called The Course of Time, an Allegory. It, appear, it appears in the December 1832 edition of the New England Magazine, signed with a star. Definitely Matthew Franklin Whittier's work, at least according to my research. This is a kind of a fantasy story where he wakes up from a, a sleep and has a vision. And his vision, this is for 1832, like the end of 1832, his vision is that the whole year is coming at him down the road as a vast assemblage of people. And they come and they pass by and then everything disappears. Now remember that Matthew had studied Stoic philosophy. He was a, a Stoic. And he had been taught mysticism by Abbey and he was now beginning to embrace it, at least the part that he could accept anyway. So she may have taught him the, the high mysticism that the entire physical world is actually an illusion. See, I mean, she really had studied some, some good sources, as near as I can tell, because I've studied the best in this lifetime for like 47 years. And whatever her sources were, she's right up there. The only, the only people I know that had access to this kind of stuff were the transcendentalists. Um, Bronson Alcott appears to have studied... Uh, sources of that qual quality in Emerson, you know, there's nobody else of this era, certainly not Margaret Fuller, you know. Uh, so she had been passing along what she had learned to Matthew. Matthew, as a skeptical philosopher, had been gradually absorbing the part of it that resonated with him that he could relate to. So I'm going to read the first couple paragraphs as best I can read it. And then I'm going to jump in a little bit later just to give you a sense of Matthew's philosophical science fiction. The Course of Time, an Allegory I had been drinking champagne. My sleep was uneasy. I began to dream. Methought I was awakened out of a quiet and profound slumber by a loud rumbling as if of heavy wagons driven furiously along a paved road mixed with a brisk rattle as of light carriages joined with a clattering of hoofs and a trampling of feet intermingled now and then with sounds somewhat more definite, as of trumpets bellowing, fiddles, screeching, men shouting, women crying, drums, bassoons, Jews harps, clarionets, and hand organs. This odd combination of sounds seemed, at first, to strike upon my ear as if from a great distance, but growing louder and louder, it soon roused me from my slumbers. I sprang upon my feet and began to look about me, Methought it was broad daylight, and as I looked around, I perceived that I had been sleeping by the side of a dusty, wide, well-traveled highway, leading to, I knew not what, great metropolis. This road was roughly paved with stones of all dimensions. Its surface was very uneven, and it was full of holes and ruts innumerable. I found myself standing at the foot of a high pillar, or rather obelisk, which was placed close by the roadside and toward far above my head, serving as I conjectured among other purposes as a landmark or milestone. At any rate, it had emblazoned upon it in large golden letters, all caps, 1832, which for some reason or other, but what I can scarcely tell, seemed to me to contain some reference to the length of the road. Uh, of course, it was the year. So this assemblage gets closer and closer of moving forward a little bit. The chariot of capital T time was surrounded by a whole host of fantastic beings, not half of whom I can at present recollect. A considerable distance before the horses' heads might be seen rumor, all caps, pressing forward with both wings and feet, half in the air and half upon the ground. Each of his hundred tongues was busy in proclaiming the approach of time, but each, I found, told a different story. In ovation, a jolly youth, 
in party-colored garments, easily kept pace with the foremost horses, swinging his cap and shouting for joy, while a gray-headed old fellow, with wig, cocked hat, and golden-headed cane, called immutability, ran panting and limping close behind him, and every now and then caught at the horse's reins in an impotent attempt to stop their career. I didn't read that right, but anyway, moving along. Just on the edge of one of the chariot scythes, and every moment in danger of being cut through, ran proca procrastination, still looking backwards with a face in which unconcern and agony, listlessness and apprehension were singularly mixed. Behind the chariot came a strange, mingled, motley crowd, all hurly-burly in confusion, but all pressing forward at the hottest speed, in earnest struggle to keep up with the career of time. There were vehicles of all sorts, sizes, and descriptions, the splendid coach and six, gilded and burnished and blazoned with armorial bearings, the dashing baroche, the handsome coach and four, the chariot and pair, the comfortable chase, the showy gig with its lively tandem, the unsocial sulky, the well-stuffed carry-all, to say nothing of lumbering stagecoaches, wagons heavily loaded with merchandise of all sorts, trucks, horse carts, ox teams, and, every now and then, a whole train of field pieces, heavy artillery, baggage, and ammunition wagons. It goes on like that, so they, you know, the, the whole society of 1832 comes by in, like, symbolic fashion, as in a dream, comes past him, and then at the end... I had passed onward but a few steps when I observed at a little distance an object that attracted all my attention by the wayside in a spot less encumbered by ruins than any other part of the road that I had seen. I observed a venerable man reclining more like one asleep than one dead against a pile of volumes of various bindings and sizes. The expression of his face was mild and benignant and quite free from those haggard lines of care with which the features of all those around him were more or less distracted. I approached him with reverence, and as I leaned forward to catch a more distinct view of his face, I discovered that many of the volumes composing the pile on which he reclined were lettered, the Waverly novels. I know nothing about the Waverly novels. I've seen them on eBay. That's all I know about them. I stood a long time in reverential silence and wrapped in meditation. At length, I turned to pursue my investigations, but I had passed onward only a short distance when I perceived that the light of day had faded into a twilight, which was itself rapidly diminishing. The noise of time's cavalcade was fast dying away in the distance and had sunk already in a low moaning, like the sound of waves on some far distant beach. All the objects around me had begun to assume a hazy and indistinct appearance. The piles of treasure and heaps of dead bodies seemed silently to sink and crumble into dust. A feeling of strange awe came over me. The whole mass of ruins with which the road had been loaded sunk imperceptibly and disappeared. I looked toward the old man in his pile of volumes. He was still distinctly visible, though all about him had vanished and left bare the rugged pavements of the road. But while I was still looking, he too began to share the common fate. His pile of volumes wasted noiselessly away. His figure and features grew indistinct, dissolved into air, and disappeared. Even the tall obelisk on which I had first taken my station began to fade from my sight. All was still and silent as the grave. The feeling of vacant loneliness was dreadful. I sunk insensible to the earth. I awoke. It was a dream, and it's signed with a star. You can just see it in my printed copy, I think. That's Matthew Franklin Whittier in December of 1832, which means he's 20, 20 years old, when he wrote the Peter Pendergrass trip to the moon. He was 1831. He was 18. Okay, so Peter Pendergrass was 18. This piece, the course of time, was 20 years old. Now, now we move on. To these, those are all before 1838 when that piece that's claimed for Edgar Allan Poe was published. Now we move to a couple other things. 
And I'm going to come back to Douglas Jarrell's Illuminated Magazine, which I have here. Now, Matthew did publish in Douglas Jarrell's Illuminated Magazine in 1848. He published an Ethan Spike story in that newspaper. It was then, it was actually then Douglas Jarrell's newspaper, so it was a different publication, but it was still Douglas Jarrell's paper. So Matthew has been published by Douglas Jarrell's like four years after this, because this, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is, this is volume one, May to October, and uh, I think this is 1843. I can't read Roman numerals. <laughs> if it's different, I will put it up on the screen. Um, and this is way at the end, which means that this would be the, what did I just say, October edition. So I'm going to go all the way to the end. This is kind of fragile. Unfortunately, the one that has Matthews in it is a little bit um, discolored. But this is called A Night with the Industrious Fleas. It's signed Pierre Shapton, G-E-N-T for gentlemen. And it reads right down the line like something Matthew would have written. It's very, uh, there's a couple others that are of Peter, Pierre Shafton's in here, and they look like Matthew's work, but they look like they've been very heavily reworked, like what I've said about some words with a mummy that Edgar Allan Poe stole from him. But this one looks like it hasn't been changed at all. Now, um, this flea circus, the Industrious Fleas, was European, but they travel to America as well. So Matthew could have seen him. And the gist of this story is that this fellow uh, is getting bitten by fleas, I believe, but at night. But the landlord at his hotel shows him a pet flea from the circus. It's a, a trained pet flea in a little tiny box. And when this fellow goes to sleep and the fleas are bothering him, he wakes up and imagines or dreams or hallucinates or sees one of the, the flea talking to him. And the flea assumes large proportions, which you can see in the image that I'll put on the screen. And they have a discussion about flea society and, and you know, the, the different types of fleas and so on. And once again, it's social commentary. It's a, it's a humorous opportunity to comment on society. Uh, I don't know if I explained that very well. I can't read the whole thing, obviously. I'll read little tiny expert excerpts, which I haven't picked out ahead of time. He starts, Traveling like misery makes us acquainted with strange bedfellows. It was on a chance visit to the great metropolis some years since that I took mine ease at a snug little tavern somewhere between 100 yards and 100 miles of the Haymarket Theater. A stranger to London, I was inquiring of some of the guests in the coffee room what were the principal sights worth seeing when I was referred to the landlord as not only the best quarter for intelligence, but as, quote, a sight in himself. So this writer has introduced himself as someone who's not familiar with London, which is kind of odd, because one would think that Pierre Shafton, a gentleman, whoever he was, would be quite familiar with London. So Pierre's would have to be pretending not to know London, whereas Matthew, you know, at this point had never been. Right? Uh then, let's see, you want to see something, do you, sir? Then I have the greatest curiosity in nature, N-A-T-U-R. Matthew used that spelling for nature in Ethan Spike. I'll put up on the screen how many times N-A-T-U-R shows up in Matthew's prose, and it's going to be a very large number. Just in Ethan Spike, it would be a huge number. Now, how common this was, how common it was for people in England to colloquialize nature as nature, I have no idea, but I know it's it shows up a great many times in Matthew's work. Um, it says, then I have the greatest curiosity in nature, I may say, in the whole world, and London to boot. And when you have seen it, you will say it beats the living skeleton, Madame Tushu's exhibition, and the infant liar to smithereens. Now, I looked up what all those references were. They're comical references to actual uh, acts. We must confess that we would at any time rather see the contents of Pandora's box 
as the miniature receptacle for abominations and probably turned away with some expression of annoyance. Wait a minute, don't be in too great a hurry, and off went the top of the box and out hopped with great alacrity, nothing more. There could be scarcely anything less than a flea. We have certainly seen more disagreeable things come out of a pillbox, and which seated himself with great composure on the back of the worthy Boniface's hand. And they go on, he, he, he writes him in dialect. Now I'll venture a stiffish bet, said mine host, that you are wondering what there is more in that flea than any other flea. I must confess, mine host, Matthew used the phrase mine host all the time. I'll put that up on the screen also. Had exactly hit the very idea that was then puzzling my brains. What do you think, sir, of his wearing a collar of gold? Look at him through this giving me a magnifying glass through which I peered at the little monster and did behold at that part where his neck should be, if peradventure fleas have necks, a shining collar of gold. And then he quotes, "'Twas strange, twas pitiful, twas wondrous true." I've looked that up too. I'll put that on the screen. I don't know if it's Shakespeare or who that is. Matthew all, always used inline quotes. And if you look up the inline quotes, you can find that they were typically his favorites. There's another one in here. Oh, love, what is it in this world of ours? So I'll look up that one also. Sometimes that gives a little bit of a clue to Matthew's authorship. But anyway, he wakes up in the middle of the night, and there's that flea sitting on his bed talking to him about fleas. Let me see if I can find something that has to do with social commentary. Allow me to introduce you to his most vindictive majesty, our emperor. Ours is a mixed constitution and we don't acknowledge the sovereign to have more than a qualified power. The only real distinction that he possesses is that he is allowed to suck a little more blood than any one of his subjects. Do you perceive any analogy between the royal prerogatives of men and fleas? He, he, he. This gentleman is a flea of eminence, the Lord High Keeper of the Great Seal and His Majesty's Conscience, and as such, Chief of the Lawyer Tribe, second only to Majesty itself and his power of imbibing. You see there, pointing to some gay-looking fleas in scarlet jackets, we don't want for heroes. They are great bloodsuckers in their way, and keep up the glory of this great nation, much in the same way as the glory of your own is kept up, by the quantity of blood that has been lost through them. Had you there, old boy, and your military greatness too, I calculate. Let us go into the common ranks of flea society, and you will find some really respectable professors of bloodsucking. And it goes on like that. So you can see the similarity between that and the Peter Pendergrass piece about the moon. And the other one that's been attributed to Poe, this is Matthew's science fiction-ish opportunity to give wry social commentary. Um, so that's a piece that I strongly believe that Matthew sent off to someone in Europe and it ended up being published in J Douglas Jarrell's publication by somebody signing with the pseudonym Pierre Shafton. We don't know who that is, but uh, that's the second person in Europe who ended up with some of Matthew's work. That, that, that would have been written probably around 1842 or so, maybe earlier, but he sent his work to people, prominent people, sometime in like the first half of 1842, which was when he would have also shared the raven with Edgar Allan Poe. Now, there's a couple others here. Um, this is Elizabeth Barrett, the future Elizabeth Barrett Browning's 1844 volume poems, which contains no less than at least four of Matthew's, possibly even one of Abby's. The Cry of the Children could possibly have originally been Abby's. But um, there's four poems, including Lady Geraldine's Courtship, A Child Asleep, which must have been sent earlier, uh, The Lost Bower, and uh, Wine of Cyprus, that were all Matthew Franklin Whittier's, and all written in the same meter, which um, Barrett didn't always write in this meter, but Matthew very often did. It's what we see in Lady Ger Geraldine's Courtship. It's what we see in The Raven. It's what we see in many of Matthew's poems. So this is called The Lost Bower, and I won't read, won't read very much of it, but the gist of it is it's a childhood anecdote, supposedly claimed as such by Elizabeth Barrett, in which the uh, writer is a child, 
going off into the into the woods, fighting his or her way through the brambles, which is very unlikely for a girl, especially on a regular basis, which this is portrayed as being the person's, the child's typical MO, and finding a magical place in the woods and never being able to find it again. Now, what this is, is Matthew, as a child, had an experience of what the New Age people today might call a dimensional shift or a time shift, an experience of the astral world, and then he never was able to recreate it. It was probably a, it was probably a literal experience of a, of a time shift or a, or a dimension shift. And the reason that he wrote this poem and submitted it was that to him, that was proof that there is such a thing as an astral world. There is such a thing as heaven because he had stepped into it by accident once. And this was a time when he was struggling terribly with his belief in life after death. That's what the Raven is about. This would have been written about the same time as the Raven was written or a little thereafter. He's reminding himself that heaven is real because as a child, he had actually experienced it briefly and then never was able to find it again. Elizabeth Barrett went in and personalized it in a few stanzas, but basically I think it's left as it was. We don't know how much she changed these things. Uh, I won't go into that. I've, I've done that in my books. There'll be an article in Real Paranormal Magazine, hopefully later this year, that goes into this whole question of Elizabeth Barrett Browning in depth. But let me see if I can find a relevant paragraph. As I entered, Moss's hushing stole all noises from my foot, and a round elastic cushion clasped within the linden's root took me in a chair of silence, very rare and absolute. All the floor was paved with glory, greenly, silently inlaid, through quick motions made before me with fair counterparts in shade of the fair serrated ivy leaves which slanted overhead. Is such pavement in a palace? So I questioned in my thought, the sun shining through the chalice of the red rose hung without, threw within a red libation like an answer to my doubt. At the same time, on the linen of my childish lap there fell two white may leaves downward winning through the ceiling's miracle from a blossom like an angel out of sight, yet blessing well. Down to floor and up to ceiling, quick I turned my childish face, with an innocence appealing for the secret of the place, to the trees which surely knew it, and partaking of the grace. Where's no foot of human creature, how could reach a human hand? And if this be work of nature, why is nature sudden bland, breaking off from other wild work? It was hard to understand. Was she weary of rough doing? Of the bramble and the thorn, did she pause in tender ruing here of all her sylvan scorn? Or, in mock of art's deceiving, was the sudden mildness worn? Or could this same bower, I fancy, be the work of Dryad Strong, who, surviving all that chanced in the world's old pagan wrong, lay hid, feeling in the woodland, on the last true poet's song? Or was this the house of fairies, left because of the rough ways, unassoiled by Ave Mary's, which the passing pilgrim prays, and beyond St. Catherine's claiming on the blessed Sabbath days? So, young muser, I sate listening to my fancy's wildest word. On a sudden, through the glistening leaves around, a little stirred, came a sound, a sense of music, which was rather felt than heard. Softly, finally, it inwound me from the world that shut me in like a fountain falling round me, which with silver waters thin clips a little marble naiad sitting smilingly within. Now, Matthew would call Abby a naiad, you know, uh, a river sprite. Um, I actually had some past life memories of being a dryad, or a Celtic priest who took care of nature. <laughs> uh, but this is, this is Matthew as a child having an experience of the astral realm. Um, is not Elizabeth Barrett Browning. 
there's actually a mistake in here, which I'll, I'll talk about in my article. She, she copied over something incorrectly. And had she written this poem, it should have been obvious to her in the context what the correct word was. And because she didn't write it and she really didn't understand it, she just wrote it the way that she interpreted it and it stayed that way. But it's some people actually changed it back, but that's going to be in my article. So that was probably written in 1842, which is about four years after this piece attributed to Poe was written. Now we've got one more. I know there's other ones. I racked my brains before I uh, started this to remember them. And I, I, I know there's other examples. This is Punch. This is 1851, the first six months of Punch magazine from Britain. And in it, there is a poem called The Groans of Wren's Ghost, written once again, basically in that same meter, if I'm not mistaken. And I am basically 100% convinced, if there's such a thing as basically 100%, I'm basically 100% convinced that this is Matthew's poem. Now, it's not too surprising because, as I said, he'd already submitted and gotten published Ethan Spike in Douglas Jarrell's magazine in 1848. So, you know, and he was coming to Europe later that year in 1851. He, he came to Europe and probably physically went to the offices of Punch, I would guess, uh, when he was there in London. So it's not surprising at all that in the months leading up to his trip, he would have submitted a poem to punch and it's excellent it's right up there with the best of anything that they ever published i would say you can see i'm quite modest about my past life accomplishments but it is it's fantastic i'm gonna i don't know if i'll read all of it but the premise of this is and it goes back there's a backstory to this that i feel in saint paul's church which quails talks about going to and he talks about seeing the statues in in St. Paul's Cathedral. So Matthew as Quails, which is not Ash and Dodge, writes about this in his travel log later on in the year. And he's noticing that they're dressed in old, you know, like Greek and Roman clothes. See, it's they're not dressed as they normally should be for their period. And he's imagining how they would feel about it. So here, their ghosts are very upset that they're shown in these ridiculous costumes. See? So it's, but he, that's his humorous side. So that's the humorous level of this thing. The level underneath it is he's making social commentary about the fact that the uh, priests are taking money from the peasants. These poor peasants are barely making it. They're actually taking money from these people. You know? and so, you know, this is social commentary. I'm kind of surprised that it was published in Punch, actually, because it's a little bit rough on the on the Brits. But it's it's set in science fiction. So once again, we have humorous, we have science fiction with humorous overtones used for social commentary, just like Peter Pendergrass and the and the Moon. I don't know how much I should read of this. I don't know how, how much I bore people. As the mighty hammer smiting 12 times on the metal falls comes a rush of ghosts alighting in the nave, in the nave of dim St. Paul's. And while through the marble sobbing circle still those waves of sound mingled with them is a throbbing as of wide wings sweeping round. For tonight the ghosts are gathered of the great that slumber here ill-used great, on whom are fathered all the marble monsters near. This past statues. Johnson's ghost is there, disgusted at his naked legs of stone, legs that, save in silk or worsted, ne'er were even to Boswell shown. Howard, with a simple wonder at his dress of sheet and key, thinks they must have made a blunder, ne'er in such attire went he. Chiefs, who wore cocked hats and feathers, on their tombs themselves behold, stripped even to their boots and leathers in their buff like knights of old. Now, I had a past life memory that came to me when I read that. And in that, I was reading this to Abby, and she tittered. She, she giggled. 
And Matthew, she was kind of the serious one, and he loved to make her laugh. You know, she had a beautiful laugh, but she was too serious. And he he loved to kind of tease her with things that would would uh, kind of <laughs> offend her Victorian sensibilities. You know, so she laughed at that about the um, in their buff like knights of old. But this poem would have been written after her death, I think, quite a bit after her death. You know, so he, I think was hearkening back to that incident where it was like an earlier poem he'd, he'd written or something. And when he read that line, she tittered, you know, and and it was such a fond memory that he worked it into this poem. That's what my past life memory says. Got no evidence for that. But then we go on with the social commentary. This is, this is Wren, uh, the man that built St. Paul's, the architect. Brother ghosts, I heard him mutter, I am here to speak my mind. Tis no time the church to butter were I ever so inclined. What is it, what is it, that with thought and toiling, toiling of the hand and brain, evil times and tempers foiling, I for worship reared this fane? In my brain the stately vision shaped itself, but long I wrought ere I won, O rare fruition, outward shape to inward thought. And, I said, as sped my labor, green my memory will be, when the poor man by his neighbor walks St. Paul's and thinks of me, as the worship I have written in these characters of stone sinks within his spirit, smitten with a sense of awe unknown, poverty will pause from caring, toil will feel a saintly rest, and the weary and wayfaring entering in will straight be blessed. That's what he's hoping would happen in St. Paul's that he created. Hearts with sin or sorrow laden at the porch will leave their weight, Sinful man and erring maiden will pass lighter from the gate. So I dreamed, a weak adapter of the fancy to the fact. Were there not the dean and chapter and the coppers to be sacked? With one voice to poor and needy calling, enter we beseech. With another whispering greedy for admission, two pence each. And it goes on to blast the priests for taking money from the poor, see? So... Wren's ghost has come back to denounce the priests for their practice of taking money from the poor as a condition of coming into the church. See? So I am 99.9999% sure that that was Matthew Franklin Whittier's poem. So there you have it. I know there's more, but I'm saying that that piece, oh, I'm totally out of focus how that happened. There we go. I'm saying that that piece that somebody thought was written by Edgar Allan Poe because it appeared in Baltimore and I think the editor was friends with him and Poe submitted works to that, you know, to that uh, publication with all of those. And it sounds kind of Poe-ish, which is partly because Poe stole Matthew's works like, you know, the, uh, the some words with a mummy was Matthew's. And so they think that's Matthew's style and the Raven was Matthew's and they think that's Excuse me, they think that's Poe's style. So the image they have in their mind of Poe's style is, you know, half of it's probably Matthew Franklin Whittier, the good part, you know, not the really dark, kind of distorted, drug influenced, you know, horror stories, the gothic, the deeply horrible gothic stuff. That's Poe, see, but, uh, or wherever he got it from. But the, the more elevated, you know, genuinely intellectual things that show some conscience some social conscience, that's Matthew Franklin Whittier. Thing. So it kind of points up how the scholars arrive at their conclusions and how I arrive at mine. The scholars arrive at their conclusions on mistaken information, rumor, putting two and two together and getting five, uh, kind of circumstantial evidence, you know, it's in Baltimore, the, you know, the guy knew Poe, sounds kind of poe so therefore it was written by Poe, see? Prospero, I don't think Matthew wrote as Prospero. Poe apparently wrote something about Prospero, see? So they think that that's, but they don't have the backstory and they don't have the intuition and they don't have the past life memory and they don't have the deep understanding of Matthew Franklin Whittier that I do. So this thing is kind of a scam. It's a strange convoluted story, but if I have it right, Matthew wrote this piece about the Atlantis uh, probably 1832, somewhere early, 
submitted it to the publication that this used to be. I'll have to put the name on the screen because I can't remember what the name of that journal was in Pennsylvania. And it was never published. The publication was sold to the fellow who took it to Baltimore, who knew Poe. He looked at it, or Poe looked at it, or they both looked at it, and they modified it a little bit so that it's not anti-slavery. And to have the protagonist be born and go to school in the South instead of in New England. And the rest of it, they left pretty much the way it was and published it in serial form. If I'm not mistaken, they didn't get all of it published because this particular publication went belly up before the whole series was uh, was published. But I have as much of it as, as was ever published from different uh, sources. So uh, it's a very strange convoluted story, but I'm pretty sure I've got it right. So I didn't have a lot of sleep and I haven't even eaten breakfast yet this morning. So I'm a little spacier than usual, I'm afraid but uh, a little more stumbling than usual. But anyway, I hope you found this interesting. I bet you there are other examples. I just can't think of them right off the top of my head. But this kind of gives an idea of how Matthew's legacy is just scattered all over the place. It was like, well, <laughs> years ago, I had a very embarrassing experience. And uh, I lived in the downstairs of a duplex, an old duplex. There's an upstairs and a downstairs, this little wooden house. And you know, I like to go to garage sales, and I was not averse to taking things off the street when people would throw them out. Well, I came home, and there's stuff scattered all over the yard, in my backyard, from the upstairs. And I start looking through it. I assume that maybe, I don't know, I didn't know what I assumed. Because normally I don't pick up stuff if they've been evicted, but I, I thought it was a sale or something, you know. So I start picking up things. Well, the guy shows up. He was the new roommate upstairs. And it was just his stuff that he was moving upstairs. He wasn't selling anything. It was, a, and there was somebody else that had had walked up and was started to look her too. It was, it was one of the most embarrassing things that ever happened to me. But this is sort of like what happened to Matthew's work. Not signing it, it's kind of like it was spread all over the yard, and people just came and helped themselves. And it was so good that it made a number of people famous, and it bought a few other people literary careers. Because, for example. Uh, Francis A. Duravage and George P. Burnham, who stole Matthew's work by tricking him out of his portfolio, they both got editorships. You know, Matthew couldn't get one, but but they both got editorships. Francis Duravage got a very nice job as a associate editor for uh, Ballou's Pictorial, you know. Um, and I think there were other examples. And then certain people got famous. So Charles Dickens. I mean, Charles Dickens was kind of going downhill with Chuzzlewit. You know, and it was a Christmas Carol that uh, that launched him, put him, relaunched him, put him back up. You know, and made him famous, and that's why we know. That's why he's a household word today, is because of a Christmas Carol. I don't think he's a household word because of anything else he wrote. You know, I mean, if you go around on the street and ask people what did Charles Dickens write, I think they won't say Great Expectations or Oliver Twist. I think they'll say a Christmas Carol. And Elizabeth Barrett Browning, she was. Uh, kind of sending her book to different people to get their opinions on it, this first one, or the 1844 one. And they all liked Matthew's work. They all liked Lady Geraldine's courtship. They didn't like the ones that she'd written. They were kind of tedious and long and boring and, you know, over-intellectual and, you know, and it was it was very upsetting to her. She went into some kind of a fugue state when they would tell her. what she, <laughs> she didn't call it that. So, uh, and Margaret Fuller, you saw from the book that I just showed you recently, Margaret Fuller Critic, that when they want to present Margaret Fuller's best work, they present those star-signed reviews in the New York Tribune, you know, which is what Matthew wrote for that paper. So Matthew made a number of people famous. And he, he gave other people careers, and he couldn't get anywhere himself. Um that charcoal drawing of Matthew that was done uh, by somebody contemporaneously came in the other day. It was from Rhode Island and it came in very quickly. The guy, I guess, was amazed anybody bought it. It's very dark, both literally and figuratively. He's very sad and kind of dark looking. And that's kind of how he's portrayed in the Whittier 
you know, legacy. But it's kind of fitting. He's really kind of caught him. You know, it's so dark unless you light it, you really can't see it. You know, but I've got it up on the wall. So uh, I'll stop rambling. I hope you see where I was going with this. Um, Matthew was writing science fiction when he was 18, you know, in 1831. You know, before Poe, before, well, there was other people, like I said, there's uh, there's Gulliver's Travels and uh, there's Jules Verne and there's a few other people that were writing, you know, in that genre, but not too many. And uh, some of them were using it for social commentary. Gulliver's Travels is certainly social commentary. And Matthew had studied all these sources, these European sources. This was what he wanted to do, even from a young boy. This was the literature that he was studying avidly, and this was what he wanted to do with his life. So I would say it's much more likely that Matthew was the original author of that than that Edgar Allan Poe was.